So welcome team Munich. So, and all the best for your presentation. Just to remind you guys, you guys have 15 minutes for your presentation followed by 10 minutes of Q and A. So all the best and over to you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> I had a high fever, nausea and diarrhea, all that and headaches and a fast heartbeat, which then turned into neurotoxicity. It basically felt like I was paralyzed. People were asking me, what's your name? And I just hummed. I couldn't move my body. They rushed me back into intensive care. This experience was shared by Michelle. She's a lymphoma patient who suffered from the severe, severe side effects of CAR T cell therapy, which is a novel anti-cancer treatment. According to the World Health Organization, cancer is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. In 2020, nearly one in six deaths were attributed to cancer. CAR T cell therapy is one emerging treatment. It uses a patient's own T cells engineered with a chimeric antigen receptor. This synthetic receptor is able to recognize and target tumor specific antigens. Like this, the patient's immune system is guided towards eliminating the cancer cells. CAR T cell therapy, however, comes with its own risks as the targeted antigen can also be found in healthy tissue. This results in the unspecific recognition with CAR T cells attacking healthy non-cancerous cells. This is also known as on target of tumor effects. The severe side effects caused by the unspecific CAR T cell activation impose a burden on the patients and force them into intensive care. Michelle's experience is only one of the countless stories that have motivated us as IGM Munich to pursue our project specific CAR, improving the specificity of CAR T cell therapy. Specific CAR relies on certain characteristics of the tumor microenvironment. One of them is an increased density of lymphocytes surrounding the tumor site. We use this tendency of T cell clustering in our project by introducing a proximity-based induction system that is fully bioorthogonal. CAR T cells are activated by neighboring T cells of the cluster, therefore localizing their activity and toxicity to the tumor site. While other approaches that target the tumor microenvironment have already been developed, our project is unique due to its reliance on the immunocellular architecture of the tumor. We modulate this activation of CAR T cells in a cluster through the secretion of a specific non-immunogenic ligand. This ligand can bind into an, engineered into an engineered cell surface receptor, triggering a bioorthogonal signal within the cells, as you can see here. So for the receptor, we chose MESA, which is modular and extracellular sen sensor architecture. The binding of our ligand is carried out by a nanobody that is located extracellularly. And the detection of a ligand relies on the dimerization of two of those MESA chains. As a result of dimerization, a tobacco edge virus protease or short TEF protease is brought into proximity with its target sequence. This results in a transcleavage event that releases the transcription factor TTA. We use tetracycline transcription activator, the TTA, as a transcription factor which regulates the expression of our target genes. <laughs> this, okay. um, this, re this release TTA binds to the TET response element, TRE, in the promoter region. This activates the production of the chimeric antigen receptor, as well as the production of our ligand. This ligand is then transported to the cell membrane and is then secreted. It is now able to bind to other MESA receptors and other cells, and therefore is able to induce the induction loop in those cells. To develop our loop system, we wanted to realize the quorum sensing loop in cell culture. For this, we focus on the three main components, the synthetic ligand, the MESA receptor, and the inducible gene. For this, we came up with a fluorescence reporter setup that allowed us to measure the functionality of these three components. For the ligand, we decided to design them with GFP and M-Cherry, both as homo and heterodimers. 
The corresponding mesoreceptors were then designed to incorporate either an anti-N cherry or an anti-GFP nanobody. The inducible gene was simply chosen to be MIRFP to read out the activation. First of all, we wanted to test the actual cell surface expression of our receptors. For this, we performed fluorescence microscopy and immunostaining. Here you can see on the red channel, the immunostained uh, cell surface uh, mesoreceptors, and in blue, you can see the DAPI stain nucleus of the cells. As you can see from the clear outline, red outlines of the cell, the receptors are expressed well on our cell surface. Not? Okay. Next, we wanted to test whether the ligands could bind to our receptors. For this, we purified the ligands ourselves manually. We added an anti, uh, no, an antibody FC domain to our ligands to dimerize them. And this also allowed us to purify them quite easily using a protein A column. These, um, oop, oh yeah, these uh, <laughs> three different uh, ligands then also had their corresponding mesoreceptors. In total, we had eight different paths for these, either with an anti-GFP or an anti-M-cherry nanobody, then with two different linker lengths to the transmembrane domain, and finally, either intracellularly with the transcription factor TTA or the TEF protease. We then expressed each of those MESA parts individually in HEC293T cells and added our purified ligand manually on top and uh, performed fluor uh, fluorescence analysis using flow cytometry afterwards. Here you can see the results on the graphs. And uh, what you can see is that for our transfected cells that express the receptor, we have an increased fluorescent signal for either the M cherry or the GFP a ligand with the exception of one sample um, down there. I can't really point to it, so I'm sorry. Um, compared to our controls. So this once again shows that the receptors are actually expressed on the cell surface of our cells but it also shows that the ligands are capable of binding to our receptors like we designed them to. Each of our MISA part was encoded on its own plasmid, which allowed us to easily combine all the possible MISA combinations. And it also allowed us to control the relative expression levels of the two combined MISA chains in our cells just by transfecting a different ratio of the plasmids into the cells. Here you can see uh, one such combination that we tested, um, where we tested whether the combination of the mesas could induce the MIRFP downstream, but also whether the addition of our ligands to the system would increase our MIRFP signal. And so analyzing just one of the combinations here, you can see we chose three different ratios of the plasmids six times, 12 times, and 24 times of more transcription factor plasmid to the TEF plasmid. Um, and in blue, you can see the samples where we didn't add any ligand on top, and the red bars are from the samples where we added the ligand. You can see that just by varying the ratio of the plasmids that we transfect, we already can influence the MIRFG signal in our cells. When we then look at different combinations of our mesoreceptors, you can see that the actual MIRFP signal varies quite a lot, just depending on the chosen combination. On some of our combination and ratios, you can see that the MIRFP signal increases with the addition of our ligand. With our best sample uh, on the top right here, which shows an increased signal of 22% roundabout. For uh, the screening, um, we were able to show that the parts themselves worked as expected. The system shows promise, but um, we are really planning to further improve the ligand, uh, the, the signal induction on addition of the ligand for our system in the future. Uh, because ideally for our quorum sensing loop, we want to have a low baseline expression followed by a high signal induction when we add the ligand to our system. With these results for our quorum sensing system, we have shown that the components themselves work like we designed them to. 
Um, the whole MESA system is designed to be modular and therefore also highly programmable. So we have a lot of options at hand to further optimize our system to really create this vision of the quorum sensing CAR T cell loop. To rationally approach the optimization of our chrome sensing loop, we worked on modeling our system as a whole, as well as crucial components individually. The main goal was to verify and to enable the fine tuning of our system's functionality. We started by developing a theoretical mathematical model. And for that, we derived ordinary differential equations for all of the protein concentrations in our loop. Next, we performed a numerical simulation, which proved the basic concept of our system, so the enhanced car expression upon CAR T cell clustering. Furthermore, we performed a variety of in silico docking simulations of our loop components. We docked the TTA, or our transcription factor TTA, to its respective DNA binding motif, as well as the inhibitor tetracycline to the TTA. Furthermore, we also investigated the modularity of our MESA ligand combination by assessing the binding affinity while simultaneously exchanging MESA nanobodies and the ligand. For this presentation, we want to focus on only one of these investigated interactions, the binding of TTA to DNA. To dock these two structures, we used HDOC, which is a tool that is specifically dedicated to the prediction of protein DNA interactions. After docking the baseline structures, we further investigated the effect of mutations on the binding affinity. We mutated the binding residues of the TTA as well as bases in the DNA, one at a time and then for each mutation predicted the respective binding affinity. We were able to identify mutations that increase the binding affinity, for example, by introducing a serine instead of a threonine at position 40, but we also found a lot of mutations that decrease the binding affinity, for example, by changing the proline at, at position 39 with an LN9. Together with the investigation of the binding of different nanobody ligand combinations, this enables us to fine tune our loop system and especially the activation threshold of it in accordance with wet lab experiments. If, for example, an experiment would show that our feedback loop gets activated too early, so if only a few CAR T cells pass together, then we could mutate the sequences so that the binding affinity is decreased and the binding therefore less likely to occur. Consequently, the activation threshold of the feedback loop is increased so that more CAR T cells are required to actually activate it. Our modeling and wet lab results show that Specifica has the potential to drastically improve CAR T cell therapy. We at IG Munich believe that CAR T cell therapy not only needs to be efficient and effective, but also safe for the patients. With Specifica, we introduce a novel strategy to make CAR T cells specific to tumors and therefore reduce the side effects of the treatment, like those patient Michelle shared with our team. We focus on developing a system which is fully bioorthogonal as well as compatible with current advances in CAR T cell research. For example, one could combine our modular um, chrome sensing loop with hypoxia sensitive CAR designs and therefore further increase the specificity. Safer CAR T cell treatment ensures financial relief for both patients and the healthcare system by reducing the long term costs of the treatment. We want to relieve patients from the burdens imposed by the severe side effects and help them to return to a comfortable and familiar environment, away from the intensive care unit back home with their loved ones. We believe that with Specifica, we have come closer to this goal. The development of Specifica was only possible with the generous help of our supervisors, supporters, and sponsors, and we want to thank all of them for accompanying us on our journey. 
we invite you to visit our booth to learn more about our activities beyond our core project. For example, our panel discussion or our school week as part of our education and outreach activities, or also for the docking simulations or our modular CAR T-cell database, OSCAR. Thank you for your time, and we are now excited to answer questions that you might have. Thank you, team. You're exactly on time. So <laughs> we'll move on to the questions. Um, judges, any questions? Anyone would like to begin? Sure. I can start? OK. Um, I would, I'm more curious to know about the linker choice. So you guys have used a linker with, uh, it's E-A-A-A-A-K, right? So I'm just curious why you went with this combination. Like I could see a negative amino acid residue and a positive amino acid residue sandwiching uh, repeated alanine residues. So could you just explain why you chose this and how it's considered to be pH sensitive. And I did see at the end that the linker didn't work for your construct, right? So just like to hear about this entire scenario. So yeah. the idea for this pH sensitive linker was based on the paper that we found. Um, so in that paper, it was shown that the um, this linker um, was pH sensitive around the area that we were interested in. So our, it was it showed the cleavage from going from pH six point no from seven to six point five in the paper, and so we were just trying to replicate this uh, paper, which it wasn't a major paper. There weren't a lot of citations, so we just wanted to create a test protein that we linked using this linker, and then wanted to replicate the experiments. And unfortunately, unfortunately for us, it didn't work, so we couldn't replicate the experiments at least in the conditions that they used in the paper and that were also interesting for us. So there might be some other special condition to activate this pH cleavage. It might, for example, also depend on the surrounding proteins because we don't, didn't use the exact same proteins as in the paper. Or there might be some ions in the buffers they used that also affected this cleavage. So for us, it was interesting going from pH 7 to pH 6 roundabout because that's where we read in literature the pH tumors roundabout. And um, yeah, at 37 degrees, like how, how we would have it in vivo um, in the buffers. So yeah, unfortunately we couldn't replicate it. So we stopped there. <laughs> to be quite honest, the paper was a bit dubious, so it might just never have really worked properly, but yeah, it was worth a try for us. Yes, thank you. But I would recommend you guys to like look into the amino acid like uh, contribution to the uh, proteolytic effect so that you understand whether you could play around with the choice of amino acids in the linker and maybe do it because the effect could be because of the length that you choose or it could be because of the amino acids that are present. So there are a lot of like uh, small, small important variables out there that you need to optimize. So would recommend you guys to do that. Yeah. So I have a question about your uh, Oscar software because it looks, to me, it looks really promising uh, and your idea is quite nice. Uh, so how do you plan to go on with uh, your project and your Oscar project? And have you already reached out to um, researchers that could feed your database with new information? Yeah, so we actually came up with it. Okay, so we, we actually came up with the idea by talking to researchers. They said there's like a lack of collaboration in the entire field and that we should maybe come up with something. Uh, we actually implemented it already. It's on oscardb.org, oscar-db.org. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so how, how did we find, uh, we filled it ourselves. So just as a proof of concept, we found a couple of cars, put those in there. Uh, we provide an API. So if researchers actually want to use it, they can just plug it into their software and get all the sequences, all the data directly from the database. And uh, we got them 
the, the data we have in there right now, we got from some papers and patents uh, that were open source. And yeah. Yeah. Just come to the mic. Yeah. Uh, one of the researchers we, we spoke to in like our interview series um, actually helped us with like an initial search for, for cars that we can put in. The reason why that specific uh, car construct is not in our database was because the annotation was lacking and uh, like the, 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 like the, the construct didn't fit per perfectly in our database yet. So, but like the, the, they helped us with initially setting out to, to get to the. Yeah, just in case we didn't mention it, OSCAR stands for Open Source Chimeric Antigen Receptors. So, <laughs> yeah. So what would be your next steps to actually get your binding affinity up? So what would be the next experiment you would perform? So we believe from the results we have so far that um, actually the main problem is our background activity being too high. So when you can look at the graphs, you can see that even without any added ligand, we already get quite a high signal. And um, we based, I mean, the MESA paper was, uh, the MESA system is already published. For example, Nature has one paper around it. And we just modified it and we chose the ratios we showed here and the, the amount of transfected plasmid based on their paper. The thing is, what we did not consider there is that we changed the plasmid backbone while we used the same cells. So HEC293T, they also used us in the paper. We have a um, backbone which has the S40 origin of replication. So we probably have too much transcription factor being expressed in our cells, which leads to this high signal. That's just an assumption. We don't know it yet. We haven't tested it. But that's what I would test next is just to go a lot lower on the transfected plasmids in our cells. Yeah. yeah, and another thing we had to consider is that the reporter, MIRFP, might take uh, more time to be expressed. So uh, for this um, experiments, we added the ligand uh, 24 hours after transfection, and then 24 hours after ligand addition, we started the measurements. So it might be more than 24 hours for the expression of MIRFP since um, yeah, MIRFP takes more time to express than other fluorescence proteins. So that would be like another step to, to be considered. If the system is so sensitive um, with the amount of protein or like plasmids that you transfect, what makes you think that it would be a good therapeutic for an actual human where you have much less control over how much is expressed? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's uh, far from of uh, usage in humans, I guess. That's definitely. I mean, there are definitely a lot of problems. I think to still solve one of them is definitely to really fine tune the system, and then also, I mean, realistically, it might take fine tuning for every patient that you have because the cell composition might be different. Um, there are a lot of variables there, so um, it might just be too complex <laughs> or too too expensive to really use for CAR T cell therapy every time. Um, to be quite honest, um, this quorum sensing loop itself, however, could be used outside of the realms of CAR T cells. So it's just an interesting system by itself to have the possibility to create a quorum sensing loop in cell culture and mammalian cell lines, which is also novel by itself. So if we just get that to work, it might also help with just basic research. And in addition, so this uh, loop, <laughs> if you would add it on top, for example, uh, to the hypoxia sensitive cells, um, it might uh, be like an additional uh, advantage. Uh, so yeah, that would be maybe a better uh, application than just the induction system. So. Thank you very much. Don't be thrown off by my main question. I actually am a big fan of your project. <laughs> Great. Um... Yeah, um, please go ahead. not necessarily um, a question. I just wanted to say that I really appreciated the fact that you guys incorporated um, patient perspectives in this project. I think oftentimes within the therapeutic and diagnostic streams, it's quite difficult to think so downstream, you know, especially doing pr proof of concepts, um, a one year project and um, a student team. So really congratulations on incorporating that and including it in your presentation 
um, I, I really enjoyed reading through your project and uh, your presentation was excellent. So great job. We have like time, so maybe we can take like one or two more questions if possible. I can ask one question. Um, so in your model, um, so uh, I will ask if I understood right. So uh, you wanted to test um, if the affinity between the, the protein and the DNA was still the same, like better or was still good? Yeah, based on, on mutations, yes. Yes, and so you you change just one mutation on the protein. Yeah, exactly, and also the DNA, and then... Uh, and so did you check if by changing only one, the, the protein itself, it, it stays stable, like, because um, it can change? Yeah, so we, we had a docking simulation actually for the mutation, yeah. so then, like, the basically just the amino acid is changed, but also the completely PDB file is computed in a new way. So we can ensure that it's not like we change this residue and now the protein is just not like the, hasn't the, the structure anymore. Also, we focused on just introducing um, conservative mutations so that we can ensure that not like the whole function of the protein is lost and that we have similar mutations in the sequence. Okay, so I think we can wrap it up because we need to give time for the next set of judges to set things up. So thank you, Team Munich, once again. It was an amazing presentation and all the best for the rest of the Jamboree. Have fun. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.